Section 1 of Chapter 25 of A History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 25, Section 1. The passions which had agitated the Parliament during the late session continued to ferment in the minds of men during the recess, and having no longer a vent in the Senate, broke forth in every part of the empire, destroyed the peace of towns, brought into peril the honour and lives of innocent men, and impelled magistrates to leave the bench of justice and attack one another sword in hand private calamities, private brawls, which had nothing to do with the disputes between court and country, were turned by the political animosities of that unhappy summer into grave political events. One mournful tale, which called forth the strongest feelings of the contending factions, is still remembered as a curious part of the history of our jurisprudence and especially of the history of our medical jurisprudence. No Whig member of the lower house, with the single exception of Montague, filled a larger space in the public eye than William Cowper. In the art of conciliating an audience, Cowper was pre-eminent. His graceful and engaging eloquence cast a spell on juries, and the commons, even in those stormy moments when no other defender of the administration could obtain a hearing, would always listen to him. He represented Hartford, a borough in which his family had considerable influence, but there was a strong Tory minority among the electors, and he had not won his seat without a hard fight, which had left behind it many bitter recollections. His younger brother Spencer, a man of parts and learning, was fast rising into practice as a barrister on the home circuit. At Hartford resided an opulent Quaker family named Stout. A pretty young woman of this family had lately sunk into a melody of a kind not very unusual in girls of strong sensibility and lively imagination who are subject to the restraints of austere religious societies. Her dress, her looks, her gestures, indicated the disturbance of her mind. She sometimes hinted her dislike of the sect to which she belonged. She complained that a canting waterman, who was one of the Brotherhood, had held forth against her at a meeting. She threatened to go beyond sea, to throw herself out of window, to drown herself. To two or three of her associates she owned that she was in love, and on one occasion she plainly said that the man whom she loved was one whom she could never marry. In fact, the object of her fondness was Spencer Cowper, who was already married. She at length wrote to him in language which she never would have used if her intellect had not been disordered. He, like an honest man, took no advantage of her unhappy state of mind, and did his best to avoid her. His prudence mortified her to such a degree that on one occasion she went into fits. It was necessary, however, that he should see her, when he came to Hartford at the Spring Assizes of 1699, for he had been entrusted with some money which was due to her on mortgage. He called on her for this purpose late one evening, and delivered a bag of gold to her. She pressed him to be the guest of her family, but he excused himself and retired. The next morning she was found dead among the stakes of a mill-dam on the stream called the Priory River. That she had destroyed herself, there could be no reasonable doubt. 
the coroner's inquest found that she had drowned herself while in a state of mental derangement but her family was unwilling to admit that she had shortened her own life and looked about for somebody who might be accused of murdering her the last person who could be proved to have been in her company was spencer cowper it chanced that two attorneys and a scrivener who had come down from town to the hartford assizes had been overheard on that unhappy night talking over their wine about the charms and flirtations of the handsome quaker girl in the light way in which such subjects are sometimes discussed even at the circuit tables and mess tables of our more refined generation some wild words susceptible of a double meaning were used about the way in which she had jilted one lover and the way in which another lover would punish her for her coquetry on no better grounds than these her relations imagined that spencer cowper had with the assistance of these three retainers of the law strangled her and thrown her corpse into the water there was absolutely no evidence of the crime there was no evidence that any one of the accused had any motive to commit such a crime there was no evidence that spencer cowper had any connection with the persons who were said to be his accomplices one of those persons indeed he had never seen but no story is too absurd to be imposed on minds blinded by religious and political fanaticism the quakers and the tories joined to raise a formidable clamour the quakers had in those days no scruples about capital punishments they would indeed as spencer cowper said bitterly but too truly rather send four innocent men to the gallows than let it be believed that one who had their light within her had committed suicide the tories exulted in the prospect of winning two seats from the whigs the whole kingdom was divided between stouts and cowpers at the summer assizes hartford was crowded with anxious faces from london and from parts of england more distant than london the prosecution was conducted with a malignity and unfairness which to us seem almost incredible and unfortunately the dullest and most ignorant judge of the twelve was on the bench cowper defended himself and those who were said to be his accomplices with admirable ability and self-possession his brother much more distressed than himself sat near him through the long agony of that day the case against the prisoners rested chiefly on the vulgar error that a human body found as this poor girl's body had been found floating in water must have been thrown into the water while still alive to prove this doctrine the counsel for the crown called medical practitioners of whom nothing is now known except that some of them had been active against the whigs at hartford elections to confirm the evidence of these gentlemen two or three sailors were put into the witness-box on the one side appeared an array of men of science whose names are still remembered among them was william cowper not a kinsman of the defendant but the most celebrated anatomist that england had then produced he was indeed the founder of a dynasty illustrious in the history of science for he was the teacher of william cheselden and william cheselden was the teacher of john hunter on the same side appeared samuel garth who among the physicians of the capital had no rival except radcliffe and hans sloane the founder of the magnificent museum which is one of the glories of our country the attempt of the prosecutors to make the superstitions of the forecastle evidence for the purpose of taking away the lives of men was treated by these philosophers with just disdain the stupid judge asked garth 
what he could say in answer to the testimony of the seamen. My lord, replied Garth, I say that they are mistaken. I will find seamen in abundance to swear that they have known whistling raise the wind. The jury found the prisoners not guilty, and the report carried back to London by persons who had been present at the trial was that everybody applauded the verdict, and that even the stouts seemed to be convinced of their error. It is certain, however, that the malevolence of the defeated party soon revived in all its energy. The lives of the four men who had just been absolved were again attacked by means of the most absurd and odious proceeding known to our old law, the appeal of murder. This attack, too, failed. Every artifice of chicane was at length exhausted, and nothing was left to the disappointed sect and the disappointed faction except to calumniate those whom it had been found impossible to murder. In a succession of libels, Spencer Cowper was held up to the execration of the public, but the public did him justice. He rose to high eminence in his profession. He at length took his seat, with general applause on the judicial bench, and there distinguished himself by the humanity which he never failed to show to unhappy men who stood, as he had once stood, at the bar. Many who seldom trouble themselves about pedigrees may be interested by learning that he was the grandfather of that excellent man, an excellent poet, William Cowper, whose writings have long been peculiarly loved and prized by the members of the religious community which, under a strong delusion, sought to slay his innocent progenitor. Though Spencer Cowper had escaped with life and honour, the Tories had carried their point. They had secured against the next election the support of the Quakers of Hartford, and the consequence was that the borough was lost to the family and to the party which had lately predominated there. In the very week in which the great trial took place at Hartford, a feud arising out of the late election for Buckinghamshire very nearly produced fatal effects. Wharton, the chief of the Buckinghamshire Whigs, had with difficulty succeeded in bringing in his brother as one of the knights of the shire. Graham Viscount Cheney, of the Kingdom of Scotland, had been returned at the head of the poll by the Tories. The two noblemen met at the quarter sessions. In England, Cheney was, before the Union, merely an esquire. Wharton was undoubtedly entitled to take place of him, and had repeatedly taken place of him without any dispute. But angry passions now ran so high that a decent pretext for indulging them was hardly thought necessary. Cheney fastened a quarrel on Wharton. They drew. Wharton, whose cool, good-humoured courage and skill in fence were the envy of all the swordsmen of that age, closed with his quarrelsome neighbour, disarmed him, and gave him his life. A more tragical duel had just taken place in Westminster. Conway Seymour, the eldest son of Sir Edward Seymour, had lately come of age. He was in possession of an independent fortune of seven thousand pounds a year, which he lavished in costly fopperies. The town had nicknamed him Beau Seymour. He was displaying his curls and his embroidery in St. James Park on a midsummer evening, after indulging too freely in wine, when a young officer of the blues named Kirk, who was as tipsy as himself, passed near him. There goes Beau Seymour, said Kirk. Seymour flew into a rage. Angry words were exchanged between the foolish boys. They immediately went beyond the precincts of the court, drew and exchanged some pushes. 
Seymour was wounded in the neck. The wound was not very serious, but when his cure was only half completed, he revelled in fruit, ice, and burgundy, till he threw himself into a violent fever. Though a coxcomb and a voluptuary, he seemed to have had some fine qualities. On the last day of his life he saw Kirk. Kirk implored forgiveness, and the dying man declared that he forgave as he hoped to be forgiven. There can be no doubt that a person who kills another in a duel is, according to law, guilty of murder, but the law had never been strictly enforced against gentlemen in such cases, and in this case there was no particular atrocity, no deep-seated malice, no suspicion of foul play. Sir Edward, however, vehemently declared that he would have life for life. Much indulgence is due to the resentment of an affectionate father maddened by the loss of a son. But there is but too much reason to believe that the implacability of Seymour was the implacability not of an affectionate father, but of a factious and malignant agitator. He tried to make what is in the jargon of our time called political capital out of the desolation of his house and the blood of his firstborn. A brawl between two dissolute youths, a brawl distinguished by nothing but its unhappy result from the hundred brawls which took place every month in theatres and taverns, he magnified into an attack on the liberties of the nation, an attempt to introduce a military tyranny. The question was whether a soldier was to be permitted to insult English gentlemen, and if they murmured, to cut their throats. It was moved in the court of King's Bench that Kirk should either be brought to immediate trial or admitted to bail. Shower, as counsel for Seymour, opposed the motion, but Seymour was not content to leave the case in Shower's hands. In defiance of all decency, he went to Westminster Hall, demanded a hearing, and pronounced a harangue against standing armies. Here, he said, is a man who lives on money taken out of our pockets. The plea set up for taxing us in order to support him is that his sword protects us and enables us to live in peace and security. And is he to be suffered to use that sword to destroy us? Kirk was tried and found guilty of manslaughter. In his case, as in the case of Spencer Cowper, an attempt was made to obtain a writ of appeal. The attempt failed, and Seymour was disappointed of his revenge. But he was not left without consolation. If he had lost a son, he had found what he seems to have prized quite as much a fertile theme for invective. The king, on his return from the continent, found his subjects in no bland humour. All Scotland, exasperated by the fate of the first expedition to Darien, and anxiously waiting for news of the second, called loudly for a parliament. Several of the Scottish peers carried to Kensington an address which was subscribed by thirty-six of their body, and which earnestly pressed William to convoke the estates at Edinburgh, and to redress the wrongs which had been done to the colony of New Caledonia. A petition to the same effect was widely circulated among the commonality of his northern kingdom, and received if report could be trusted, not less than thirty thousand signatures. Discontent was far from being as violent in England as in Scotland. Yet in England there was discontent enough to make even a resolute prince uneasy. The time drew near at which the houses must reassemble, and how were the commons to be managed? Montague, enraged 
mortified and intimidated by the baiting of the last session, was fully determined not again to appear in the character of chief minister of finance. The secure and luxurious retreat which he had some months ago prepared for himself was awaiting him. He took the auditorship and resigned his other places. Smith became Chancellor of the Exchequer. A new commission of treasury issued and the first name was that of Tankerville. He had entered on his career more than twenty years before, with the fairest hopes, young, noble, nobly allied, of distinguished abilities, of graceful manners. There was no more brilliant man of fashion in the theatre and in the ring. There was no more popular tribune in Guildhall. Such was the commencement of a life so miserable that all the indignation excited by great faults is overpowered by pity. A guilty passion amounting to a madness left on the moral character of the unhappy man a stain at which even libertines looked grave. He tried to make the errors of his private life forgotten by splendid and perilous services to a public cause and having endured in that cause penury and exile, the gloom of a dungeon, the prospect of a scaffold, the ruin of a noble estate, he was so unfortunate as to be regarded by the party for which he had sacrificed everything as a coward, if not a traitor. Yet even against such accumulated disasters and disgraces, his vigorous and aspiring mind bore up. His parts and eloquence gained for him the ear of the House of Lords, and at length, though not till his constitution was so broken that he was fitter for flannel and cushions than for a laborious office at Whitehall, he was put at the head of one of the most important departments of the administration. It might have been expected that this appointment would call forth clamours from widely different quarters, that the Tories would be offended by the elevation of a rebel, that the Whigs would set up a cry against the captain to whose treachery or faint-heartedness they had been in the habit of imputing the rout of Sedgemoor, and that the whole of that great body of Englishmen which cannot be said to be steadily Whig or Tory but which is zealous for decency and the domestic virtues, would see with indignation a signal mark of royal favour bestowed on one who had been convicted of debauching a noble damsel, the sister of his own wife. But so capricious is public feeling that it will be difficult, if not impossible, to find in any of the letters, essays, dialogues and poems which bear the date of 1699 or of 1700, a single allusion to the vices or misfortunes of the new First Lord of the Treasury. It is probable that his infirm health and his isolated position were his protection. The chiefs of the opposition did not fear him enough to hate him. The Whig Junto was still in their terror and their abhorrence. They continued to assail Montague and Orford, though with somewhat less ferocity than while Montague had the direction of the finances and Orford of the marine. But the utmost spite of all the leading malcontents were concentrated on one object the great magistrate who still held the highest civil post in the realm, and who was evidently determined to hold it in defiance of them. It was not so easy to get rid of him as it had been to drive his colleagues from office. His abilities the most intolerant Tories were forced grudgingly to acknowledge. His integrity might be questioned in nameless libels and in coffee-house tattle, but was certain to come forth bright and pure from the most severe parliamentary investigation. Nor was he guilty of those faults of temper and of manner to which 
more than to any grave delinquency the unpopularity of his associates is to be described he had as little of the insolence and perverseness of orford as of the petulance and vaingloriousness of montague one of the most severe trials to which the head and heart of man can be put is great and rapid elevation to that trial both montague and somers were put it was too much for montague but somers was found equal to it he was the son of a country attorney at thirty-seven he had been sitting in a stuff gown on a back bench in the court of king's bench at forty-two he was the first lay dignitary of the realm and took precedence of the archbishop of york and the duke of norfolk he had risen from a lower point than montague had risen as fast as montague had risen as high as montague and yet had not excited envy such as dogged montague through a long career garreteers who were never weary of calling the cousins of the earls of manchester and sandwich an upstart could not without an unwonted sense of shame apply those words to the chancellor who without one drop of patrician blood in his veins had taken his place at the head of the patrician order with the quiet dignity of a man ennobled by nature his serenity his modesty his self-command proof even against the most sudden surprises of passion his self-respect which forced the proudest grandees of the kingdom to respect him his urbanity which won the hearts of the youngest lawyers of the chancery bar gained for him many private friends and admirers among the most respectable members of the opposition but such men as howe and seymour hated him implacably they hated his commanding genius much they hated the mild majesty of his virtue still more they sought occasion against him everywhere and they at length flattered themselves that they had found it End of section one section two of chapter twenty five of a history of england by thomas babington macaulay this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 25, Section 2. Some years before, while the war was still raging, there had been loud complaints in the city that even privateers of St. Malo's and Dunkirk caused less molestation to trade than another class of marauders. The English navy was fully employed in the Channel, in the Atlantic, and in the Mediterranean. The Indian Ocean, meanwhile, swarmed with pirates of whose rapacity and cruelty frightful stories were told many of these men it was said came from our north american colonies and carried back to those colonies the spoils gained by crime adventurers who durst not show themselves in the thames found a ready market for their ill-gotten spices and stuffs at new york even the puritans of new england who in sanctimonious austerity surpassed even their brethren of scotland were accused of conniving at the wickedness which enabled them to enjoy abundantly and cheaply the produce of Indian looms and Chinese tea plantations. In 1695 Richard Coote, Earl of Bellamont, an Irish peer who sat in the English House of Commons, was appointed Governor of New York and Massachusetts. He was a man of eminently fair character upright courageous and independent though a decided whig 
he had distinguished himself by bringing before the parliament at westminster some tyrannical acts done by whigs at dublin and particularly the execution if it is not rather to be called the murder of gaffney before bellamont sailed for america william spoke strongly to him about the free booting which was the disgrace of the colonies i send you my lord to new york he said because an honest and intrepid man is wanted to put these abuses down and i believe you to be such a man bellamont exerted himself to justify the high opinion which the king had formed of him it was soon known at new york that the governor who had just arrived from england was bent on the suppression of piracy and some colonists in whom he placed great confidence suggested to him what they may perhaps have thought the best mode of attaining that object there was then in the settlement a veteran mariner named william kidd he had passed most of his life on the waves had distinguished himself by his seamanship had had opportunities of showing his valour in action with the french and had retired on a competence no man knew the eastern seas better he was perfectly acquainted with all the haunts of the pirates who prowled between the cape of good hope and the straits of malacca and he would undertake if he were entrusted with a single ship of thirty or forty guns to clear the indian ocean of the whole race the brigantines of the rovers were numerous no doubt but none of them was large one man of war which in the royal navy would hardly rank as a fourth rate would easily deal with them all in succession and the lawful spoils of the enemies of mankind would much more than defray the charges of the expedition bellamont was charmed with this plan and recommended it to the king the king referred it to the admiralty the admiralty raised difficulties such as are perpetually raised by public boards when any deviation whether for the better or for the worse from the established course of proceeding is proposed it then occurred to bellamont that his favourite scheme might be carried into effect without any cost to the state a few public-spirited men might easily fit out a privateer which would soon make the arabian gulf and the bay of bengal secure highways for trade he wrote to his friends in england imploring remonstrating complaining of their lamentable want of public spirit six thousand pounds would be enough the sum would be repaid and repaid with large interest from the sale of prizes and an inestimable benefit would be conferred on the kingdom and on the world his urgency succeeded shrewsbury and romsey contributed orford though as first lord of the admiralty he had been unwilling to send kidd to the indian ocean with a king's ship consented to subscribe a thousand pounds somers subscribed another thousand a ship called the adventure galley was equipped in the port of london and kidd took the command he carried with him besides the ordinary letters of mark a commission under the great seal empowering him to seize pirates and to take them to some place where they might be dealt with according to law whatever right the king might have to the goods found in the possession of these malefactors he granted by letters patent to the person who had been at the expense of fitting out the expedition reserving to himself only one-tenth part of the gains of the adventure which was to be paid into the treasury with the claim of merchants to have back the property of which they had been robbed his majesty of course did not interfere he granted away and could grant away no rights but his own the press for sailors to man the royal navy was at that time so hot that kidd could not obtain his full complement of hands in the thames 
he crossed the atlantic visited new york and there found volunteers in abundance at length in february sixteen ninety seven he sailed from the hudson with a crew of more than a hundred and fifty men and in july reached the coast of madagascar it is possible that kidd may at first have meant to act in accordance with his instructions but on the subject of piracy he held the notions which were then common in the north american colonies and most of his crew were of the same mind he found himself in a sea which was constantly traversed by rich and defenceless merchant ships and he had to determine whether he would plunder those ships or protect them the gain which might be made by plundering them was immense, and might be snatched without the dangers of a battle or the delays of a trial. The rewards of protecting the lawful trade were likely to be comparatively small. Such as they were, they would be got only by first fighting with desperate ruffians, who would rather be killed than taken and by then instituting a proceeding and obtaining a judgment in a court of admiralty. The risk of being called to a severe reckoning might not unnaturally seem small to one who had seen many old buccaneers living in comfort and credit at New York and Boston. Kidd soon threw off the character of a privateer and became a pirate. He established friendly communications, and exchanged arms and ammunition with the most notorious of those rovers whom his commission authorized him to destroy, and made war on those peaceful traders whom he was sent to defend. He began by robbing Mussulmans, and speedily proceeded from Mussulmans to Armenians, and from Armenians to Portuguese. The adventure gallery took such quantities of cotton and silk, sugar and coffee, cinnamon and pepper, that the very foremast men received from a hundred to two hundred pounds each, and that the captain's share of the spoil would have enabled him to live at home as an opulent gentleman. With the rapacity, Kidd had the cruelty of his odious calling. He burned houses, he massacred peasantry. His prisoners were tied up and beaten with naked cutlasses in order to extort information about their concealed hordes. One of his crew, whom he had called a dog, was provoked into exclaiming in an agony of remorse, Yes, I am a dog, but it is you that have made me so. Kid, in a fury, struck the man dead. News then travelled very slowly from the eastern seas to England. But in August 1698 it was known in London that the adventure galley, from which so much had been hoped, was the terror of the merchants of Surat and the villagers of the coast of Malabar. It was thought probable that Kidd would carry his booty to some colony. Orders were therefore sent from Whitehall, to the governors of the transmarine possessions of the crown, directing them to be on the watch for him. He, meanwhile, having burned his ship and dismissed most of his men, who easily found berths in the sloops of other pirates, returned to New York with the means, as he flattered himself, of making his peace and living in splendor. He had fabricated a long romance to which Bellamont, naturally unwilling to believe that he had been duped and had been the means of duping others was at first disposed to listen with favour but the truth soon came out the governor did his duty firmly and kidd was placed in close confinement till orders arrived from the admiralty that he should be sent to england to an intelligent and candid judge of human actions, it will not appear that any of the persons at whose expense the adventure galley was fitted out deserved serious blame. The worst that could be imputed even to Bellamont, who had drawn in all the rest, 
was that he had been led into a fault by his ardent zeal for the public service and by the generosity of a nature as little prone to suspect as to devise villainies his friends in england might surely be pardoned for giving credit to his recommendation it is highly probable that the motive which induced some of them to aid his design was genuine public spirit but if we suppose them to have had a view to gain it was to legitimate gain their conduct was the very opposite of corrupt not only had they taken no money they had dispersed money largely and had dispersed it with the certainty that they should never be reimbursed unless the outlay proved beneficial to the public that they meant well they proved by staking thousands on the success of their plan and if they erred in judgment the loss of those thousands was surely a sufficient punishment for such an error on this subject there would probably have been no difference of opinion had not Summers been one of the contributors. About the other patrons of Kidd, the chiefs of the opposition cared little. Bellamont was far removed from the political scene. Romney could not, and Shrewsbury would not, play a first part. Orford had resigned his employments, but Summers still held the great seal, still presided in the House of Lords still had constant access to the closet the retreat of his friends had left him the sole and undisputed head of that party which had in the late parliament been a majority and which was in the present parliament outnumbered indeed disorganized and disheartened but still numerous and respectable his placid courage rose higher and higher to meet the dangers which threatened him he provided for himself no refuge he made no move towards flight and without uttering one boastful word gave his enemies to understand by the mild firmness of his demeanour that he dared them to do their worst in their eagerness to displace and destroy him they overreached themselves had they been content to accuse him of lending his countenance with a rashness unbecoming his high place to an ill-concerted scheme that large part of mankind which judges of a plan simply by the event would probably have thought the accusation well founded but the malice which they bore him was not to be so satisfied they affected to believe that he had from the first been aware of kidd's character and designs the great seal had been employed to sanction a piratical expedition the head of the law had laid down a thousand pounds in the hope of receiving tens of thousands when his accomplices should return laden with the spoils of ruined merchants it was fortunate for the chancellor that the calumnies of which he was the object were too atrocious to be mischievous and now the time had come at which the hoarded ill-humour of six months was at liberty to explode on the sixteenth of november the houses met the king in his speech assured them in gracious and affectionate language that he was determined to do his best to merit their love by constant care to preserve their liberty and their religion by a pure administration of justice by countenancing virtue by discouraging vice by shrinking from no difficulty or danger when the welfare of the nation was at stake these he said are my resolutions and I am persuaded that you are come together with purposes on your part suitable to these on mine. Since then our aims are only for the general good, let us act with confidence in one another, which will not fail by God's blessing to make me a happy king and you a great and flourishing people. It might have been thought that no words less likely to give offence 
had ever been uttered from the English throne. But even in those words the malevolence of faction sought and found matter for a quarrel. The gentle exhortation, let us act with confidence in one another, must mean that such confidence did not now exist, that the king distrusted the parliament, or that the parliament had shown an unwarrantable distrust of the king. Such an exhortation was nothing less than a reproach, and such a reproach was a bad return for the gold and the blood which England had lavished in order to make and keep him a great sovereign. There was a sharp debate, in which Seymour took part, with characteristic indelicacy and want of feeling. He harangued the commons as he had harangued the court of King's Bench about his son's death, and about the necessity of curbing the insolence of military men. There were loud complaints that the events of the preceding session had been misrepresented to the public, that emissaries of the court in every part of the kingdom declaimed against the absurd jealousies or still more absurd parsimony which had refused to his majesty the means of keeping up such an army as might secure the country against invasion. Even justices of the peace, it was said, even deputy lieutenants, had used King James and King Lewis as bugbears for the purpose of stirring up the people against honest and thrifty representatives. Angry resolutions were passed, declaring it to be the opinion of the House that the best way to establish entire confidence between the King and estates of realm would be to put a brand on those evil advisers who had dared to breathe in the royal ear calumnies against a faithful Parliament. An address founded on these resolutions was voted. Many thought that a violent rupture was inevitable. But William returned an answer so prudent and gentle that malice itself could not prolong the dispute. By this time, indeed, a new dispute had begun. The address had scarcely been moved when the House called for copies of the papers relating to Kidd's expedition. Summers, conscious of innocence, knew that it was wise as well as right to be perfectly ingenuous, and resolved that there should be no concealment. His friends stood manfully by him, and his enemies struck at him with such blind fury that their blows injured only themselves. Howe raved like a maniac. What is to become of the country, plundered by land, plundered by sea? Our rulers have laid hold on our lands, our woods, our mines, our money. And all this is not enough. We cannot send a cargo to the farthest ends of the earth, but they must send a gang of thieves after it. Harley and Seymour tried to carry off a vote of censure without giving the House time to read the papers, but the general feeling was strongly for a short delay. At length, on the 6th of December, the subject was considered in a committee of the whole House. Shower undertook to prove that the letters patent to which Summers had put the great seal were illegal. Cowper replied to him with immense applause, and seems to have completely refuted him. Some of the Tory orators had employed what was then a favourite claptrap. Very great men, no doubt, were concerned in this business. But were the commons of England to stand in awe of great men, would not they have the spirit to censure corruption and oppression in the highest places? Cowper answered finally that assuring the House ought not to be deterred from the discharge of any duty by the fear of great men. But that fear was not the only base and evil passion of which great men were the objects, and that the flatterer who courted their favour was not a worse citizen than the envious calumniator who took pleasure in bringing whatever was eminent down to his own level. 
at length after a debate which lasted from midday till nine at night and in which all the leading members took part the committee divided on the question that the letters patent were dishonourable to the king inconsistent with the law of nations contrary to the statutes of the realm and destructive of property and trade the chancellor's enemies had felt confident of victory and had made the resolution so strong in order that it might be impossible for him to retain the great seal they soon found that it would have been wise to propose a gentler censure great numbers of their adherents convinced by cowper's arguments or unwilling to put a cruel stigma on a man of whose genius and accomplishments the nation was proud stole away before the door was closed to the general astonishment there were only one hundred and thirty-three eyes to one hundred and eighty-nine noes that the city of london did not consider somers as the destroyer and his enemies as the protectors of trade was proved on the following morning by the most unequivocal of signs as soon as the news of his triumph reached the royal exchange the price of stocks went up end of section two three of chapter twenty five of a history of england by thomas babington macaulay this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of england by thomas babington macaulay chapter twenty five section three some weeks elapsed before the tories ventured again to attack him in the meantime they amused themselves by trying to worry another person whom they hated even more bitterly when in a financial debate the arrangements of the household of the duke of gloucester were incidentally mentioned one or two members took the opportunity of throwing reflections on burnet burnet's very name sufficed to raise among the high churchmen a storm of mingled merriment and anger the speaker in vain reminded the orators that they were wandering from the question the majority was determined to have some fun with the right reverend whig and encouraged them to proceed nothing appears to have been said on the other side the chiefs of the opposition inferred from the laughing and cheering of the bishop's enemies and from the silence of his friends that there would be no difficulty in driving from court with contumely the prelate whom of all prelates they most detested as the personification of the latitudinarian spirit a jack presbyter in lawn sleeves they therefore after the lapse of a few hours moved quite unexpectedly an address requesting the king to remove the bishop of salisbury from the place of preceptor to the young heir apparent but it soon appeared that many who could not help smiling at burnet's weaknesses did justice to his abilities and virtues the debate was hot the unlucky pastoral letter was of course not forgotten it was asked whether a man who had proclaimed that england was a conquered country a man whose servile pages the english commons had ordered to be burned by the hangman could be a fit instructor for an english prince some reviled the bishop for being a socinian which he was not and some for being a scotchman which he was his defenders fought his battle gallantly grant they said that it is possible to find amidst an immense mass of eloquent and learned matter published in defence of the protestant religion and of the english constitution a paragraph which though well intended was not well considered 
is that error of an unguarded minute to outweigh the services of more than twenty years if one house of commons by a very small majority censured a little tract of which his lordship was the author let it be remembered that another house of commons unanimously voted thanks to him for a work of a very different magnitude and importance the history of the reformation and as to what is said about his birthplace is there not already ill-humour enough in scotland has not the failure of that unhappy expedition to darien raised a sufficiently bitter feeling against us throughout that kingdom every wise and honest man is desirous to soothe the angry passions of our neighbours and shall we just at this moment exasperate those passions by proclaiming that to be born on the north of the tweed is a disqualification for all honourable trust the ministerial members would gladly have permitted the motion to be withdrawn but the opposition elated with hope insisted on dividing and were confounded by finding that with all the advantage of a surprise they were only one hundred and thirty-three to one hundred and seventy-three. Their defeat would probably have been less complete had not all those members who were especially attached to the Princess of Denmark voted in the majority or absented themselves. Marlborough used all his influence against the motion, and he had strong reasons for doing so he was by no means well pleased to see the commons engaged in discussing the characters and past lives of the persons who were placed about the duke of gloucester if the high churchman by reviving old stories succeeded in carrying a vote against the preceptor it was by no means likely that some malicious whig might retaliate on the governor the governor must have been conscious that he was not invulnerable, nor could he absolutely rely on the support of the whole body of Tories, for it was believed that their favourite leader, Rochester, thought himself the fittest person to superintend the education of his grand nephew. From Burnet the opposition went back to Somers. Some crown property near Reigate had been granted to Somers by the king, in this transaction there was nothing that deserved blame. The great seal ought always to be held by a lawyer of the highest distinction, nor can such a lawyer discharge his duties in a perfectly efficient manner unless, with the great seal, he accepts a peerage. But he may not have accumulated a fortune such as will alone suffice to support a peerage. His peerage is permanent and the tenure of the great seal is precarious. In a few weeks he may be dismissed from office, and may find that he has lost a lucrative profession, that he has got nothing but a costly dignity, that he has been transformed from a prosperous barrister into a mendicant lord. Such a risk no wise man will run. If, therefore, the state is to be well served in the highest civil post, it is absolutely necessary that a provision should be made for retired chancellors. The sovereign is now empowered by an act of parliament to make such a provision out of the public revenue. In old times, such a provision was ordinarily made out of the hereditary domain of the crown, what had been bestowed on Summers appears to have amounted, after all deductions, to a net income of about sixteen hundred a year, a sum which will hardly shock us, who have seen at one time five retired chancellors enjoying pensions of five thousand a year each. For the crime, however, of accepting this grant, the leaders of the opposition hoped that they should be able to punish Summers with disgrace and ruin. One difficulty stood in the way. All that he had received was but a pittance when compared with the wealth which some of his persecutors had been loaded by the last two kings of the House of Stuart. 
it was not easy to pass any censure on him which should not imply a still more severe censure on two generations of Granvilles, on two generations of Hydes, and on two generations of Finches. At last, some ingenious Tory thought of a device by which it might be possible to strike the enemy without wounding friends. The grants of Charles and James had been made in time of peace, and William's grant to Somers had been made in time of war. Malice eagerly caught at this childish distinction. It was moved that any minister who had been concerned in passing a grant for his own benefit while the nation was under the heavy taxes of the late war had violated his trust, as if the expenditure which is necessary to secure the country a good administration of justice ought to be suspended by war or as if it were not criminal in a government to squander the resources of the state in time of peace the motion was made by james bridges eldest son of the lord chandos the james bridges who afterward became duke of chandos who raised a gigantic fortune out of war taxes to squander it in comfortless and tasteless ostentation and who is still remembered as the Timon of Pope's keen and brilliant satire. It was remarked as extraordinary that Bridges brought forward and defended his motion merely as the assertion of an abstract truth, and avoided all mention of the Chancellor. It seemed still more extraordinary that Howe, whose eloquence consisted in cutting personalities, named nobody on this occasion and contented himself with declaiming in general terms against corruption and profusion. It was plain that the enemies of Somers were at once urged forward by hatred and kept back by fear. They knew that they could not carry a resolution directly condemning him. They therefore cunningly brought forward a mere speculative proposition which many members might be willing to affirm without scrutinizing it severely. But as soon as the major premise had been admitted, the minor would be without difficulty established, and it would be impossible to avoid coming to the conclusion that Somers had violated his trust. Such tactics, however, have very seldom succeeded in English parliaments. For a little good sense, and a little straightforwardness are quite sufficient to confound them. A sturdy Whig member, Sir Roland Gwynne, disconcerted the whole scheme of operations. Why this reserve, he said? Everybody knows your meaning. Everybody sees that you have not the courage to name the great man whom you are trying to destroy. That is false, cried Bridges and a stormy altercation followed. It soon appeared that innocence would again triumph. The two parties seemed to have exchanged characters for one day. The friends of the government, who in the Parliament were generally humble and timorous, took a high tone, and spoke as it becomes men to speak who are defending persecuted genius and virtue. The malcontents, generally so insolent and turbulent, seemed to be completely cowed. They abased themselves so low as to protest, what no human being could believe, that they had no intention of attacking the Chancellor, and had framed their resolution without any view to him. How, from whose lips scarcely anything ever dropped but gall and poison, went so far as to say, My Lord Somers is a man of eminent merit, of merit so eminent that if he had made a slip, we might well overlook it. At a late hour the question was put, and the motion was rejected by a majority of fifty in a house of four hundred and nineteen members. It was long since there had been so large an attendance at a division. 
The ignominious failures of the attacks on Summers and Burnett seemed to prove that the assembly was coming round to a better temper. But the temper of a House of Commons, left without the guidance of a ministry, is never to be trusted. Nobody can tell today, said an experienced politician of that time, what the majority may take it into their heads to do tomorrow. Already a storm was gathering in which the Constitution itself was in danger of perishing, and from which none of the three branches of the legislature escaped without serious damage. The question of the Irish forfeitures had been raised, and about that question the minds of men, both within and without the walls of Parliament, were in a strangely excitable state. Candid and intelligent men, whatever veneration they may feel for the memory of William, must find it impossible to deny that in his eagerness to enrich and aggrandize his personal friends, he too often forgot what was due to his own reputation and to the public interest. It is true that in giving away the old domains of the crown, he did only what he had a right to do, and what all his predecessors had done. Nor could the most factious opposition insist on resuming his grants of those domains, without resuming at the same time the grants of his uncles. But between those domains and the estates recently forfeited in Ireland, there was a distinction, which would not indeed have been recognized by the judges, but which to a popular assembly might well seem to be of grave importance. In the year 1690, a bill had been brought in for applying the Irish forfeitures to the public service. That bill passed the Commons, and would probably, with large amendments, have passed the Lords, had not the King, who was under the necessity of attending the Congress at The Hague, put an end to the session. In bidding the Houses farewell on that occasion, he assured them that he should not dispose of the property about which they had been deliberating, till they should have had another opportunity of settling that matter. He had, as he thought, strictly kept his word, for he had not disposed of this property till the Houses had repeatedly met and separated without presenting to him any bill on the subject. They had had the opportunity which he had assured them that they should have. They had had more than one such opportunity. The pledge which he had given them had therefore been amply redeemed, and he did not conceive that he was bound to abstain longer from exercising his undoubted prerogative. But, though it could hardly be denied that he had literally fulfilled his promise, the general opinion was that such a promise ought to have been more than literally fulfilled. If his Parliament, overwhelmed with business which could not be postponed without danger to his throne and to his person, had been forced to defer, year after year, the consideration of so large and complex a question as that of the Irish forfeiture, it ill became him to take advantage of such a lashes, with the eagerness of a shrewd attorney. Many persons, therefore, who were sincerely attached to his government, and who on principle disapproved of resumptions, thought the case of these forfeitures an exception to the general rule. The Commons had, at the close of the last session, tacked to the Land Tax Bill a clause empowering seven commissioners, who were designated by name, to take account of the Irish forfeitures, and the lords and the king, afraid of losing the land tax bill, had reluctantly consented to this clause. During the recess the commissioners had visited Ireland, they had since returned to England. Their report was soon laid before both houses. By the Tories, and by their allies, the Republicans, it was eagerly hailed. It had indeed been framed for the express purpose of flattering and of inflaming them. 
three of the commissioners had strongly objected to some passages as indecorous and even calumnious but the other four had overruled every objection of the four the chief was trenchard he was by calling a pamphleteer and seems not to have been aware that the sharpness of style and temper which may be tolerated in a pamphlet is inexcusable in a state paper he was certain that he should be protected and rewarded by the party to which he owed his appointment and was delighted to have it in his power to publish with perfect security and with a semblance of official authority bitter reflections on king and ministry dutch favourites french refugees and irish papists the consequence was that only four names were subscribed to the report the three dissentients presented a separate memorial as to the main facts however there was little or no dispute it appeared that more than a million of irish acres or about seventeen hundred thousand english acres an area equal to that of middlesex hertfordshire bedfordshire cambridgeshire and huntingdonshire together had been forfeited during the late troubles but of the value of this large territory very different estimates were formed the commissioners acknowledged that they could obtain no certain information in the absence of such information they conjectured the annual rent to be about two hundred thousand pounds and the fee simple to be worth thirteen years purchase that is to say about two millions six hundred thousand pounds they seem not to have been aware that much of the land had been let very low on perpetual leases and that much was burdened with mortgages a contemporary writer who was evidently well acquainted with ireland asserted that the authors of the report had valued the forfeited property in carlo at six times the real market price and that the two million six hundred thousand pounds of which they talked would be found to shrink to about half a million which as the exchanges then stood between dublin and london would have dwindled to about four hundred thousand pounds by the time that it reached the english exchequer it was subsequently proved beyond all dispute that this estimate was very much nearer the truth than that which had been formed by trenchard and trenchard's colleagues of the seventeen hundred thousand acres which had been forfeited above a fourth part of it had been restored to the ancient proprieties in conformity with the civil articles of the treaty of limerick about one-seventh of the remaining three-fourths had been given back to unhappy families which though they could not plead the letter of the treaty had been thought fit objects of clemency the rest had been bestowed partly on persons whose seances merited all and more than all that they obtained but chiefly on the king's personal friends romney had obtained a considerable share of the royal bounty but of all the grants the largest was to woodstock the eldest son of portland the next was to albemarle an admirer of william cannot relate without pain that he divided between these two foreigners an extent of country larger than hertfordshire this fact simply reported would have sufficed to excite a strong feeling of indignation in a house of commons less irritable and querulous than that which then sat at westminster but trenchard and his confederates were not content with simply reporting the fact they employed all their skill to inflame the passions of the majority they at once applied goads to its anger and held out baits to its cupidity they censured that part of william's conduct which deserved high praise even more severely 
than that part of his conduct for which it is impossible to set up any defence. They told the Parliament that the old proprietors of the soil had been treated with pernicious indulgence, that the capitulation of Limerick had been construed in a manner far too favourable to the conquered race, and that the king had suffered his compassion to lead him into the error of showing indulgence to many who could not pretend that they were within the terms of the capitulation. Even now, after the lapse of eight years, it might be possible by instituting a severe inquisition and by giving proper encouragement to informers to prove that many papists who were still permitted to enjoy their estates had taken the side of james during the civil war there would thus be a new and plentiful harvest of confiscations the four bitterly complained that their task had been made more difficult by the hostility of persons who held office in ireland and by the secret influence of great men who were interested in concealing the truth these grave charges were made in general terms no name was mentioned no fact was specified no evidence was tendered End of section three Section four of chapter twenty five of a history of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter twenty five, section four. Had the report stopped there? those who drew it up might justly have been blamed for the unfair and ill-natured manner in which they had discharged their functions but they could not have been accused of usurping functions which did not belong to them for the purpose of insulting the sovereign and exasperating the nation but these men well knew in what way and for what purpose they might safely venture to exceed their commission the act of parliament from which they derived their powers authorized them to report on estates forfeited during the late troubles it contained not a word which could be construed into an authority to report on the old hereditary domain of the crown with that domain they had as little to do as with the seigniorage levied on tin in the duchy of cornwall or with the church patronage on the duchy of lancaster but they had discovered that a part of that domain had been alienated by a grant which they could not deny themselves the pleasure of publishing to the world it was indeed an unfortunate grant a grant which could not be brought to light without much mischief and much scandal it was long since william had ceased to be the lover of elizabeth villiers long since he had asked her counsel or listened to her fascinating conversation except in the presence of other persons she had been some years married to george hamilton a soldier who had distinguished himself by his courage in ireland and flanders and who probably held the courtier-like doctrine that a lady is not dishonoured by having been the paramour of a king william was well pleased with the marriage bestowed on the wife a portion of the old crown property in Ireland, and created the husband a peer of Scotland by the title of Earl of Orkney. Assuredly William would not have raised his character by abandoning to poverty a woman whom he had loved, though with a criminal love. He was undoubtedly bound, as a man of humanity and honour, to provide liberally for her, but he should have provided for her rather by saving from his civil list than by alienating his hereditary revenue the four malcontent commissioners rejoiced with spiteful joy over this discovery 
it was in vain that the other three represented that the grant to lady orkney was one with which they had nothing to do and that if they went out of their way to hold it up to obloquy they might be justly said to fly in the king's face to fly in the king's face said one of the majority our business is to fly in the king's face we were sent here to fly in the king's face with this patriotic object a paragraph about lady orkney's grant was added to the report a paragraph too in which the value of that grant was so monstrously exaggerated that william appeared to have surpassed the profligate extravagance of his uncle charles the estate bestowed upon the countess was valued at twenty four thousand pounds a year the truth seems to be that the income which she derived from the royal bounty after making allowance for encumbrances and for the rate of exchange was about four thousand pounds the success of the report was complete the nation and its representatives hated taxes hated foreign favorites and hated irish papists and here was a document which held out the hope that england might at the expense of foreign courtiers and of popish celts be relieved from a great load of taxes many both within and without the walls of parliament gave entire faith to the estimate which the commissioners had formed by a wild guess in the absence of trustworthy information they gave entire faith also to the prediction that a strict inquiry would detect many traitors who had hitherto been permitted to escape with impunity and that a large addition would thus be made to the extensive territory which had already been confiscated it was popularly said that if vigorous measures were taken the gain to the kingdom would not be less than three hundred thousand pounds a year and almost the whole of this sum a sum more than sufficient to defray the whole charge of such an army as the commons were disposed to keep up in time of peace would be raised by simply taking away what had been unjustifiably given to dutchmen who would still retain immense wealth taken out of english pockets or unjustifiably left to irishmen who thought it at once the most pleasant and the most pious of all employments to cut english throats the lower house went to work with the double eagerness of rapacity and of animosity as soon as the report of the four and the protest of the three had been laid on the table and read by the clerk it was resolved that a resumption bill should be brought in it was then resolved in opposition to the plainest principles of justice that no petition from any person who might think himself aggrieved by this bill should ever be received it was necessary to consider how the commissioners should be remunerated for their services and this question was decided with impudent injustice it was determined that the commissioners who had signed the report should receive a thousand pounds each but a large party thought that the dissentient three deserved no recompense and two of them were merely allowed what was thought sufficient to cover the expense of their journey to ireland this was nothing less than to give notice to every man who should ever be employed in any similar inquiry that if he wished to be paid he must report what would please the assembly which held the purse of the state in truth the house was despotic and was fast contracting the vices of a despot it was proud of its antipathy to courtiers and it was calling into existence a new set of courtiers who would study all its humours who would flatter all its weaknesses who would prophesy to it smooth things and who would assuredly be in no respect less greedy less faithless or less abject than the sycophants who bow in the antechambers of kings indeed the dissentient commissioners 
had worse evils to apprehend than that of being left unremunerated. One of them, Sir Richard Levince, had mentioned in private to his friends some disrespectful expressions which had been used by one of his colleagues about the king. What he had mentioned in private was, not perhaps very discreetly, repeated by Montague in the house. The predominant party eagerly seized the opportunity of worrying both Montague and Levince. A resolution implying a severe censure on Montague was carried. Levince was brought to the bar and examined. The four were also in attendance. They protested that he had misrepresented them. Trenchard declared that he had always spoken of His Majesty as a subject ought to speak of an excellent sovereign, who had been deceived by evil counsellors, and who would be grateful to those who should bring the truth to his knowledge. He vehemently denied that he had called the grant to Lady Orkney villainous. It was a word that he never used, a word that never came out of the mouth of a gentleman. These assertions will be estimated at the proper value by those who are acquainted with Trenchard's pamphlets, pamphlets in which the shocking word villainous will without difficulty be found, and which are full of malignant reflections on William. But the house was determined not to believe Levince. He was voted a calumniator and sent to the tower as an example of all who should be tempted to speak truth which the commons might not like to hear. Meanwhile the bill had been brought in, and was proceeding easily. It provided that all the property which had belonged to the crown at the time of the accession of James the Second, or which had been forfeited to the crown since that time, should be vested in trustees. These trustees were named in the bill, and among them were the four commissioners who had signed the report. All the Irish grants of William were annulled. The legal rights of persons other than the grantees were saved, but of those rights the trustees were to be judges, and judges without appeal. A claimant who gave them the trouble of attending to him, and could not make out his case, was to be heavily fined. Rewards were offered to informers who should discover any property which was liable to confiscation, and which had not yet been confiscated. Though eight years had elapsed since an arm had been lifted up in the conquered island against the domination of the Englishry, the unhappy children of the soil, who had been suffered to live submissive and obscure on their hereditary fields, were threatened with a new and severe inquisition into old offences. Objectionable as many parts of the bill undoubtedly were, nobody who knew the House of Commons believed it to be possible to carry any amendment. The King flattered himself that a motion for leaving at his disposal a third part of the forfeitures would be favourably received. There can be little doubt that a compromise would have been willingly accepted twelve months earlier. But the report had made all compromise impossible. William, however, was bent on trying the experiment, and Vernon consented to go on what he considered as a forlorn hope. He made his speech and his motion, but the reception which he met was such that he did not venture to demand a division. This feeble attempt at obstruction only made the impetuous current chafe the more. Hal immediately moved two resolutions, one attributing the load of debts and taxes which lay on the nation to the Irish grants, the other censuring all who had been concerned in advising or passing those grants. Nobody was named not because the majority was inclined to show any tenderness to the Whig ministers, but because some of the most objectionable grants had been sanctioned by the Board of Treasury when Godolphin and Seymour, 
who had great influence with the country party, sat at that board. Howe's two resolutions were laid before the king by the speaker, in whose train all the leaders of the opposition appeared at Kensington. Even Seymour, with characteristic effrontery, showed himself there as one of the chief authors of a vote which pronounced him guilty of a breach of duty. William's answer was that he had thought himself bound to reward, out of the forfeited property, those who had served him well, and especially those who had borne a principal part in the reduction of Ireland. The war, he said, had undoubtedly left behind it a heavy debt, and he should be glad to see that debt reduced by just and effectual means. This answer was but a bad one, and in truth it was hardly possible for him to return a good one. He had done what was indefensible, and by attempting to defend himself he made his case worse. It was not true that the Irish forfeitures, or one-fifth part of them, had been granted to men who had distinguished themselves in the Irish war, and it was not judicious to hint that those forfeitures could not justly be applied to the discharge of the public debts. The commons murmured, and not altogether without reason. His Majesty tells us, they said, that the debts fall to us, and the forfeitures to him, we are to make good out of the purses of Englishmen what was spent upon the war, and he is to put into the purses of Dutchmen what was got by the war. When the House met again, Howe moved that whoever had advised the King to return such an answer was an enemy to His Majesty and the Kingdom, and this resolution was carried with some slight modification. To whatever criticism William's answer might be open, he had said one thing which well deserved the attention of the House. A small part of the forfeited property had been bestowed on men whose services to the State well deserved a much larger recompense, and that part could not be resumed without gross injustice and ingratitude. An estate of very moderate value had been given with the title of Earl of Athlone, to Ginkle, whose skill and valour had brought the war in Ireland to a triumphant close. Another estate had been given, with the title of Earl of Galway, to Ruvigny, who in the crisis of the decisive battle, at the very moment when St. Ruth was waving his hat, and exclaiming that the English should be beaten back to Dublin, had at the head of a gallant body of horse, struggled through the morass, turned the left wing of the Celtic army, and retrieved the day. But the predominant faction, drunk with insolence and animosity, made no distinction between courtiers who had been enriched by injudicious partiality, and warriors who had been sparingly rewarded for great exploits achieved in defence of the liberties and the religion of our country. Athlone was a Dutchman, Galway was a Frenchman, and it did not become a good Englishman to say a word in favour of either. Yet this was not the most flagrant injustice of which the commons were guilty. According to the plainest principles of common law and of common sense, no man can forfeit any rights except those which he has. All the donations which William had made, he had made subject to this limitation. But by this limitation the commons were too angry and too rapacious to be bound. They determined to vest in the trustees of the forfeited lands an estate greater than had ever belonged to the forfeiting landholders. Thus innocent persons were violently deprived of property, which was theirs by descent or by purchase, of property which had been strictly respected by the king and his grantees. No immunity was granted even to men who had fought on the English side, even to men who had lined the walls of Londonderry 
and rushed on the Irish guns at Newton Butler. In some cases the commons showed indulgence, but their indulgence was not less unjustifiable, nor of less pernicious example than their severity. The ancient rule, a rule which is still strictly maintained, and which cannot be relaxed without danger of boundless profusion and shameless jobbery, is that whatever the Parliament grants shall be granted to the Sovereign, and that no public bounty shall be bestowed on any private person except by the Sovereign. The lower house now, contemptuously disregarding both principles and precedents, took on itself to carve estates out of the forfeitures for persons whom it was inclined to favour. To the Duke of Ormond especially, who ranked among the Tories and was distinguished by his dislike of the foreigners, marked partiality was shown. Some of his friends, indeed, hoped that they should be able to insert in the bill a clause bestowing on him all the confiscated estates in the county of Tipperary, but they found that it would be prudent in them to content themselves with conferring on him a boon smaller in amount, but equally objectionable in principle. He had owed very large debts to persons who had forfeited to the crown all that belonged to them. Those debts were therefore now due from him to the crown. The house determined to make him a present of the whole. That very house which would not consent to leave a single acre to the general who had stormed Athlone, who had gained the Battle of Achrim, who had entered Galway in triumph, and who had received the submission of Limerick. That a bill so violent, so unjust, and so unconstitutional would pass the Lords without considerable alteration was hardly to be expected. The ruling demagogues, therefore, resolved to join it with the bill which granted to the Crown a land tax of two shillings in the pound for the service of the next year, and thus to place the upper house under the necessity of either passing both bills together without the change of a word, or rejecting both together, and leaving the public creditor unpaid and the nation defenceless. There was great indignation among the peers. They were not indeed more disposed than the commons to approve of the manner in which the Irish forfeitures had been granted away, for the antipathy to the foreigners strong as it was in the nation generally, was strongest in the highest ranks. Old barons were angry at seeing themselves preceded by new earls from Holland and from Gelders. Garters, gold keys, white staves, ranger ships, which had been considered as peculiarly belonging to the hereditary grandees of the realm, were now intercepted by aliens. Every English nobleman felt that his chance of obtaining a share of the favours of the crown was seriously diminished by the competition of Bentinks and Keppels, over Querques and Zulesteins. But, though the riches and dignities heaped on the little knot of Dutch courtiers might disgust him, the recent proceedings of the commons could not but disgust him still more. The authority, the respectability, the existence of his order were threatened with destruction. Not only, such were the just complaints of the peers, not only are we to be deprived of that coordinate legislative power to which we are by the constitution of the realm entitled, we are not to be allowed even a suspensive veto. We are not to dare to remonstrate, to suggest an amendment, to offer a reason, to ask for an explanation. Whenever the other house has passed a bill to which it is known that we have strong objections, that bill is to be tacked to a bill of supply. If we alter it, 
we are told that we are attacking the most sacred privilege of the representatives of the people, and that we must either take the whole or reject the whole. If we reject the whole, public credit is shaken. The Royal Exchange is in confusion. The bank stops payment. The army is disbanded. The fleet is in mutiny. The island is left without one regiment, without one frigate, at the mercy of every enemy. The danger of throwing out a bill of supply is doubtless great, yet it may on the whole be better that we should face that danger once and for all than we should consent to be what we are fast becoming, a body of no more importance than the convocation. End of section 4